This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Hey guys, this is Raz Schaefer from My Campaign Coach, and you're listening to the How to Run for Office podcast. Thank you guys so much for downloading this week and for the subscribers for hitting that subscribe button. It's not much work, but it means a lot to us, and it makes sure that every single week you're going to be among the first to get the new episode, the new interview, or expert dive into some campaign topic that you guys have requested. This week we're going to have a really special interview, because it's not often that we get to talk to best-selling authors that I get to get on the phone with somebody and pick their brain, and especially when it comes to a topic like hostage negotiation. And you may be wondering, what in the world does hostage negotiation have to do with my political campaign, raising money, getting votes, getting endorsements? And as you listen to this podcast today, I think that the answer has become very clear. And as Chris Voss, who's the CEO of Black Swan Group and the author of the best-selling Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It. That's the book he wrote. It came out last year, and I get to read it now twice that I've gone through it. And I've listened to this podcast two or three times even before putting it up because the advice he shares is just phenomenal. He talks about the fact that these are nine strategies that he lays out in the book, whether it's negotiating a bedtime for your kids or a raise from your boss or talking about getting hostages out alive from a terrorist incident, that these are strategies that work across the board because there's certain things about humans that are the same, whatever culture they come from, whatever background they have, whatever city they live in, whether they're terrorists or your boss. (laughs) Sometimes it can be like the two are the same thing. In 2008, Chris founded the Black Swan Group, which specializes in solving business communication problems using hostage negotiation solutions. Chris has used many years of experience in international crisis and high-stakes negotiations as an SBI agent to develop a unique program and team that applies these globally proven techniques to the business world. Chris and his team have helped companies secure and close better deals, save money, and solve internal communication problems between senior management and employees. Prior to 2008, Chris was the lead international kidnapping negotiator for the FBI, as well as the FBI's hostage negotiation representative for the National Security Council's hostage working group. Before becoming the FBI lead international kidnapping negotiator, Chris served as a lead crisis negotiator for the New York City Division of the FBI. He was a member of the New York City Joint Terrorist Task Force for 14 years. Chris has a lot of great info to share with us today, so let's get right to the interview. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's an honor to have you on. Yeah, Rez, I'm I'm happy to be here, man. It's it's very it's very cool. Thank you. Well, I've I've read your book. Now I'm on my second time through. By the time this comes out, I will have at least completed it twice. I've been uh, marking up the margins and taking lots of notes because I, I think it's an incredible book uh, for negotiation in general. But there's so much application that I'm seeing as I'm reading through it on the political side. And so you've, you've done a lot of podcasts that I'd, I'd encourage folks to listen to talking about the book. But today we're going we're gonna to go deep on the political side, kind of exploring some of the applications there. For, for folks that haven't, uh, haven't had the good fortune to read your book yet, could you give us a little bit of background about kind of your story and how you became involved in negotiation? Yeah, well, um, I was lucky enough to become an FBI agent. I was originally a police officer, Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Before that, small town Iowa boy town of about 7,000 people, son of Richard and Joyce Voss, blue collar, uh, working class, middle class. My father was an entrepreneur, got dirty, you know, uh, and that's the environment I, I grew up in, work hard. Became an FBI agent and was working in New York City counterterrorism and got interested in hostage negotiation. I had actually been on the SWAT team, uh, had a recurring knee injury, wanted to stay in crisis response. You know, if you're not out laying in the mud and rain with the swatters, uh, you're on the phone as a hostage negotiator, uh, actually talking to people out. I figured it wouldn't be that hard. You know, I figured, (laughs) yeah, I talk to people all day long. I could talk to terrorists. You know, it ended up being not only a lot more involved than I expected, but a lot more satisfying than SWAT ever was. And I love SWAT. But negotiation just became something that, uh, you know, there's just some magic about it, accomplishing more with words uh, than I could with actions. So uh, did a deep dive into it, volunteered on a crisis hotline, New York City, 
uh, got involved in a bank robbery with hostages in New York, which is actually a really rare event, interestingly enough. Um, and then because of my terrorism background, started working kidnappings around the world and just, you know, got up to my elbows in this human nature communication, emotional intelligence, which is the fundamental issues of, of everything we do. I mean, that's kind of in a nutshell how it worked out. Taught at Harvard and uh, have been applying the hostage negotiation ideas to every other aspect, uh, business and personal life since I left the Bureau in 2007. Anybody that picks up your book is gonna be treat, treated to a ton of awesome stories that are, that are riveting looking at how you've gone through specific hostage negotiation situations and, and working to try to you know, save lives and, and save business deals. Uh, but one of my favorites was uh, how you actually got the, got the opportunity to even go to hostage negotiation training with the, the, the crisis or sorry, the suicide hotline and your supervisor, you going to them and saying, look, I want to do this. They said no. And, uh, and you had to actually you know, really fight for your job. And you took the, uh, the strange step of actually doing what she told you to do, which is go volunteer <laughs> for a suicide hotline. And nobody else had ever done that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. Like today, in today's world, everybody wants mentors and they're just looking to not do the work. And I realized that Amy Bondaro was one of the mentors that I unofficially recruited. You know, you go, go to somebody who's in charge or somebody who knows how to do it, ask them what to do, and then do the crazy thing, actually do what they tell you. <laughs> and I, it seems, and nobody does it. And so I, I, you know, I went to Amy and she, she, you know, she shooed me away. She's basically like, get, you know, go away. Everybody wants to be a <laughs> hostage negotiator. Everybody wants to do that. Yeah. And I was utterly unqualified and she was com completely underwhelmed by me. And I said, you know, what could I do? She said, go volunteer on a suicide hotline. Now go away until you've done that. <laughs> and I, and I went and did it and came back five months later and she was shocked. And I was shocked that she was shocked. Right. You know, um, because that's what I'd always done. All the turning points in my career were just like following good advice uh, as opposed to, you know, cherry picking advice. Right. And when I got back in touch with Amy to put the story in the book, she said, you know, I, I told a thousand people to do that. Two of them did. You were one of them. Oh, my gosh. Well, and that uh, allowed you to jump five i think it was five people four or five yeah. people that were ahead of you technically ahead of you that had asked before and had degrees and training and all these things and what you did by just doing what she told you to do and the valuable insight that she knew you would have gained through that practice she said man chris is the guy he's getting the top spot that one spot that comes open chris has got it yeah you know and, and amy reluctantly admitted that she pulled me out of line and put me in front of everybody else but it was the right thing to do because the other thing, too, is, you know, I don't know why people rest on their laurels, their, 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 their degrees, their experience. All the people that she pulled me past in line, I think all of them ended up on the team eventually and none of them amounted to anything. None of them took the self-initiation uh, to go out and go at follow advice and go after it and stay with it. Um, you know, they were lazy. And, uh, and, and that's actually what I, all the traits that I look for, for people that I wanted to mentor and bring along subsequent to, to me getting in. I'm a hundred percent in agreement with that. That's, that's one of the things that in politics, you know, there, there are lots of young people that want to get involved that, and, and honestly, a lot of the times they want to go straight from being the poli sci major to being on Fox news. <laughs> that's kind of the career. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's the, you get to go from there. If they chart out their future courses, you know, at uh, one year, you're a senior in college, and then come about May 15th or so, a couple of days after graduation, you got a you got a spot on Fox News, and uh, that sometimes happens. But oftentimes, those people flame out early. It's the ones that do the hard work. Uh, oftentimes, I advise folks to say, "Look, if you want to get involved in politics or campaigns, go pick a candidate you want to help, and go do whatever they need." whether it's cleaning bathrooms, emptying trash, just look for an opportunity, knocking doors, sticking envelopes, filling them, and whatever it is, do it. And your willingness to do the scut work, to do the unfun, unsexy side, you're going to prove yourself, and that's going to tell them something about your character. Because I, I, I think it's true of, of the negotiating skills that you talk about, but I know it's true of politics. It's like I can teach a lot, but what I can't teach is your character. And you're going to develop it yourself, or your mommy and daddy are going to teach you but at the end of the day, you, you, that's not something that I can do. 
Yeah, you know, agree, agree a thousand percent. I mean, uh, hard work is a shortcut, right? Hard work is a hack. <laughs> yes. uh -huh. You know, if, you, if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and go clean bathrooms for a politician, if that's what the guy asks you to do, or, or whoever that you want to mentor you and give you a break, I mean, that's actually the first test. And you, you will, 90% uh, of the people will be screened out on the, on, on the first test, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and honestly, 90% might be undershooting it a little bit. You talk about the just couple people that slip through by doing that hard work, the sweat hack. And, uh, you know, that, that honestly, growing up, I mean, that's what my parents taught me. And when I got out of college, having been surrounded by people that were hardworking and smart, I assumed that it was going to be a lot harder to stand out than it actually turned out to be. Because it turns out that if you're willing to do hard work, do the unfun, unsexy task, and just keep your nose to the grindstone, you're automatically in a pretty rare setting. There aren't a whole lot of people out there that fit those qualifications. So if you do, you're going to get promoted. You're going to get those opportunities. Yeah, very true. Thousand percent agree. So from there, you you spent years developing you know these ideas, and you really got to kind of be on the cutting edge within the FBI and within the the negotiating community within the hostage and crisis response of developing some some pretty unique. Uh, so your theories and hypotheses about negotiation and proving those out kind of going from the, the get to yes philosophy and really turning that and saying what actually works in when you're talking to a terrorist got a gun to somebody's head. Talk, talk to me a little bit about how that developed and, and what your involvement was like there. Yeah, well, it was constantly about getting better, you know, and um, there, there's this, there's a saying data improves design. I mean, you, you want to get better. Uh, you don't get better on the sidelines. You don't get better from the bleachers. You, you got to get out on the court. You, you got you to gotta get into it. You got to try it. You got to be willing to make mistakes uh, and improve on those mistakes. You, you got to be willing to uh, that your method might be flawed um, and, and constantly improve. So, yeah, I just, you know, I was I started out the stuff on a suicide hotline. I thought this is transformative. And, you know, the crazy thing about the hotline, you know, I figured you take a suicide crisis call, you're going to be on the phone for hours. Like right off the bat, they said, you got 20 minutes. No I'm pressure. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. That, that, that's insane. You can't turn anybody around in 20 minutes. And they said, yeah, you can. If you, if you stick to the process and lo and behold, they were right. And I thought this, if, if I turn around somebody in 20 minutes on a hotline, this stuff's got to be applicable to regular life. There's, there's got to be similar dynamics. And so I was constantly determined when it worked, you know, I was like, awesome. And when it didn't work, I was like, wait a minute, I got to figure out what happened. Like, you know, the old saying in hostage negotiation was this stuff works, just don't try it at home. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought, no, that can't be right. I mean, how is genuine understanding and genuine connection? Why should you deny the people that are most important to you in your world this. And so what I had to do is figure out what we were doing as negotiators that why was it failing in real life? And I learned that because I tried it in real life. You know, I, I had to, you know, the ex Mrs. Voss and there is an ex Mrs. Voss. You know, when she blew up at me one time, I mean, went through the roof when I, when I used something that I was straight off the hotline. And instead of saying to myself, this didn't, this is, this didn't work. I said to myself, I didn't do it right. What am I missing? I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to get better. And, and so through everything that I did, every iteration of it, it was on a desire to, to willing, willing to fail and determined to improve. Well, and, and I, given my, I've got a three month old son at home. I'm uh, I liked it in the book you talked about and said over and over, this is something you can use from negotiating your kid's bedtime all the way to multimillion dollar years and uh, you know, contracts and terrorists. So <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to, uh, to bone it up on this so I can negotiate bedtime as well. I've under, I understand now the necessity of that. <laughs> ah, yeah. Very good. Yeah. I mean, uh, my co-author, Tal Roz, brilliant, brilliant business writer. That, that's why, he co-authored our book, you know, and I will say it's our book and I will include three people. I would quote, quote me, uh, Tall, and actually my son, Brandon, who was a sounding board for all of this all along. And for all intents and purposes, he's an uncredited author in the book. You know, I, I mentioned that in the acknowledgments. But, um, you know, Tall, Tall's sounding board through the process was his sister. And he was telling his sister about one of the techniques, marrying, and she said, I'm trying this on my nine-year-old right now. 
And she calls her nine-year-old on the phone because she'd had something that she was dealing with with, with her own child. And she gets off the phone and she was like, wow, that totally worked. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned mirroring. That's one of the nine major uh, major strategies that you talk about in the book, right? Right. It's one of the negotiation nine, the nine skills. Yeah, mirroring. And, and so throughout the book, you walk them through nine, these nine strategies from mirroring to getting to know, resist compromise, all the way through you know, bargaining hard and finding black swans. And you know, throughout this book, you're not just giving ideas, you're giving, you're talking about your real life situations where you face those both with family, with negotiating stuff with Brandon and the football team, to talking about situations where you were working with you know, real life and death situations with you know, the Philippines and terrorist hostages all through this. It's, it's a fascinating book, just kind of looking back at how you've applied these things. And like I said, I'm on my second time through. It's it's uh, I'm still learning a lot. In uh, in my job, working especially my, with my new job, doing a lot of major donor solicitations, I was I was recently talking with some colleagues, and I was bringing up the idea of getting to know, because that's that's kind of the opposite of the the getting to yes philosophy that so much of uh, of donations and, and donor solicitation has revolved around for decades, and it uh, and it was something that hardly anybody had heard about. And it's, it, that's one of the, the strategies that really stuck out to me in the book. Let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper and kind of tell, the, tell our guys what this is about, what getting to know is all about. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. And, you know, uh, one, of the, one of our phrases is a, a, a calibrated no is worth at least five yeses. Uh, so what do I mean by a calibrated no? Um, instead of saying, would this work for you? Saying, is it a ridiculous idea? that this might work. Now, there's something about saying no that makes us feel protected and safe. And because of that, we sort of center ourselves. We, a lot of rational thinking is triggered. And interestingly enough, regardless of how fatigued we are, because I have, um, I've told my assistants in the past, you don't ask me a single opening to question after two o'clock in the afternoon. Don't give me what and how's. Don't try to get me to say yes. You got a question for me. Phrase it in a way that I can say no and it'll move the ball forward. And I found that no matter how tired I am, I could still say no to something. And I, I, and I find myself collecting my thoughts, focusing and moving forward, even with decision fatigue, which is something we all suffer from. Any time after we've been up anywhere from four to six hours, our brain is starting to slow down from decision fatigue. So no kicks, hacks that entire process. We feel safe. We feel protected. We're able to think more clearly. Now, we'd kind of been playing around with this idea for a while when I started teaching at Georgetown. We really got into it after in, in a very big way, um, just after, just before I was leaving a bureau and then in single sentence questions like, um, do you want the other side to win? You know, we'd use it in a, in a domestic siege and we'd want to say to a guy who's waving his wife around or his gun around because he's mad at his ex-wife, do you want her to win? And they collect their thoughts and move it forward. But then really one of our students at Georgetown was a political fundraiser. And he was working at night at, uh, and the story's in the book. Bring a kid. I love it when somebody takes my ideas and moves them down the line. And what he did was he's working for, at night on a um, political fundraising machine where they're dialing for dollars like everybody else does. Like every salesperson in the world, this, this, this yes momentum garbage uh, momentum selling, yesable agreements. Like I'm telling you, that's horrible. If you're doing this, it's hurting you. You're leaving money on the table. What do they do? They call somebody on the phone at night. They got three straight questions where the answer is yes. And they ask them for donations. You know, would you like to see the Republicans back in the white house in December? This was, I think the second Obama, um, uh, second time Obama run. Mm -hmm. He takes the three yes oriented questions and flips them all to no's. The first one, instead of, would you like to see the Republicans in the White House in November, goes to, have you given up on taking the White House back in November? Um, and I apologize if you're hearing background noise. Um, <laughs> That's all right. But that, and that, have you given up on, is ended up being one of our single most powerful calibrated no's, no-oriented questions. They, he runs that night the yes script side by side with the no script. The end of the night, the no script has a 23% higher donation rate. That's phenomenal. I, and that's, 
you know, for, for folks that haven't worked in that kind of phone solicitation board, that's, that's remarkable. I mean, that's huge. That's a huge difference. And it, it's just mind boggling that that's not further adopted. But you even talked in the book about how that was kind of shut down not too long after because it made the, the, the guys who are running it uncomfortable. Yeah, nobody wants to admit that the, uh, their approach could be improved on. You know, they, they think um, uh, saying that you can improve your approach, approach is somehow that you've done something wrong. Or if you haven't heard it before, there's, there's all these biases that my academic brothers and sisters at Harvard will point out. Projection bias, you know, decision bias, you know, all these biases that stop us from making from making good calls. And, the, you know, they went, hmm, you know, that last night was, you know, that, that was an aberration. That was just luck. And I thought to myself, all right, fine. You know, um, if you're going to be if you're going to be closed minded and there's actually a psychological dynamic called openness, which you can test for. I'm not knocking myself out with people who have closed minds because there's there's enough people out there with open minds that I, my my approach is fine. I'm going to find the open minded and we are going to compete with you and we're going to beat you. And okay. my clients beat people. And I think a lot of that comes down to people's fear of failure, because you know in that situation that you know the people that got the contract to do the fundraising, they're they know that if they do the the thing that everybody else is doing and they don't raise a whole lot of money, nobody's ever going to ask a question about what's wrong because they stuck within they had their numbers within the industry average. But, well, here's and if, and, I, and I'm I know I'm interrupting you. And oh, please for forgive it. me. Um, here's the two millimeter shift. People aren't afraid to fail. They're afraid to fail in a new way. And because if you if you say people are afraid to fail, a lot of people say, I'm not scared to fail. I fail all the time. I realize, you know, my batting average is only about, you know, 215 or 250. Right, right. That's what good. we've really seen over and over again is people are horrified to fail in a new way because that's where they think the world is going to end. That's a good point. I really like that. So as you... As you go through this process and you're, you're looking more and more, you, you've applied these principles of negotiation across the board. And you give a ton of examples. I think that's, uh, that's one of the things you do really well in the book is by showing so many different types of negotiation from your son and football teams to you know, on down the line. Uh, it makes it very, very hard for somebody to look at to read your book and say, oh, this won't work in my situation, <laughs> which uh, is, that, is yeah, perfect. That yeah, and it comes through very clearly because I think that that's – for the people that, as you said, are afraid to fail in a new way, that's the excuse they're looking for. You know, that may work with terrorists or that may work with Brandon on the football team, but that's not going to work with my boss. And I think you do a wonderful job breaking through that and saying, look, humans are humans. We have a human nature. We have ways that our minds and our brains and our bodies work. And, and these are strategies that are proven to work regardless of situation if you're dealing with humans. Exactly. thousand percent right. And, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons these days, it's a little bit easier to make that case that there are fundamental dynamics that engage all human beings, regardless of culture. And, and you know, people want to say, ah, you know, it's different across culture. Cultures are different. My question to you is what culture has not not only accepted, but totally embraced Facebook mm -hmm. across the planet? The only the only place. The people are not addicted to Facebook is China, and that's because the Chinese government bans it because they know that there's a human nature aspect to Facebook that is literally topple governments, and they're not yeah. willing to take that chance. No, you're absolutely right. Well, and you break through that that it won't work in other cultures argument well with, with several of the examples you give in the book. I think that it's, it's a compelling case for saying, look, if you want to negotiate and I think you prove well that you talk about in the book how life is negotiation. This isn't just about contracts or you know, agreements or getting closing donor deals. It's, it's life. And by yeah. I, I, as I read through the book, I felt like I got a greater understanding for just interpersonal communication, not just you know trying to hammer out a deal, but just how to be a better friend, a better husband. It, it really impressed me with just the widespread application when you open your mind and say, how can I apply this knowledge? Where can I put it that maybe Chris hasn't thought of yet or is not specifically applied in the book? And it's, I cannot recommend it highly enough. <laughs> I hope the listeners are, are getting on Amazon as they're, as they're listening and, and ordering this thing because it is, uh, it's going to make a difference in their lives. 
Uh, well, he, he, and to interrupt you again, because there's something you just said that, that I think it's, you know, I don't know that you really understood the importance of what you just said. What you just outlined about yourself is you're a guy who likes to learn. Absolutely. Yep. I, and I think that's you know, that, that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed doing the podcast, because I have to interview people that are smarter than me all the time. And it's a lot of fun because I get to help feed that that hunger for knowledge. And as I've talked to a lot of the listeners of the show and got to build a relationship with them, that's come through clearly as well. And it's, it's a lot of why I want to have you on because you know, your background is not political, but you understand human nature. And have, I've just spent a, an immense amount of time and energy researching how to uh, how to make things happen in relationships. Yeah. So there were there were three things that I want us to dive into, specific to uh, to politics, and given that that's where our, our listeners are coming from, uh, the first is you know when you we look at whether it's Congress or state legislature or a city council, uh, I, and when I read your book and I, I look out in the world and I try to find examples of politicians or people in that are negotiating legislation or policy and I try to find good examples of that. It's really, really hard and frankly depressing. What are some strategies, you know, as our listeners are, are either elected officials or running for office, those kind of things, what are some of these strategies that you think that people can use to try to break through a lot of the, the ridiculousness of the modern political discourse and try to actually get their points across and, and turn their, their principles into policy? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great question. I love it because we applied that when we were negotiating against terrorists in the public in the public domain and terrorism really terrorism is a form of politics mm -hmm. and a uh, terrorist is not really trying to intimidate us a terrorist are trying to recruit people in the middle ground to their side so the secondary audience is most important to a terrorist is for, and, and terrorism is about making public statements to try to recruit terrorism is about recruitment and fundraising and you know the most dangerous negotiation is one you don't know you're in and we would engage in that and we would beat them at their own game and we would beat them at their own game by telling what I used to refer to as the indisputable truth. Now, a lot of people hear that and they say, what are you calling me a liar? No, I'm not calling you a liar. But, you know, typically what you want to say is actually spin. And one of the greatest examples of the indisputable truth that then swayed millions recently was you know, after the Charlottesville problems with the demonstrators on both sides, you know, and, and, and President Trump uh, awkwardly trying to be con uh, conciliatory to both sides. I mean, you know, he's trying to find a middle ground there. And it ended up, uh, you know, this, this attempt to find middle ground. And he got criticized roundly on all sides. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so then who puts out a tweet that is ends up being one of the most, I think the second most retweeted tweet in the history of Twitter? But Barack Obama, who is not known for his Twitter alacrity, his Twitter ability and agility, and all he does in the midst of that is he quotes Nelson Mandela and says people are not born hating other people. Right. And now that's the indisputable truth. Mm -hmm. But he he throws something out there that people on nobody on either side can criticize. No matter no matter what your what what whatever you say, you know it's effectively getting a that's right response from your yeah. adversary. Right. And uh, and for a guy whose Twitter game was not particularly strong, to throw out an indisputable truth and then it just it it it's viral. It catches. Like wildfire. And if it was the second most retweeted tweet in the history of Twitter, then in my view, that by definition means people on both sides of the aisle were jumping on board. It could not have appealed to only his constituency if it was repeated that much. So he, he people who would otherwise have been in opposition to him politically or whatever his political positions were, had to have picked that up and been inspired by it and enthused by it, and then suddenly found themselves in support of a, of a former president uh, who, in any given presidency, the very next president after him is about saying, the guy before me stunk, that's mm -hmm. why I'm here and I'm better to fix things. Right. You know, that's not no single, the current president is not any more guilty of that than presidents that went before him. No, not at all. 
So, um, you know, what's what what are human nature dynamics and what gets picked up? The indisputable truth gets picked up by both sides. And it's very hard to tell in terrorism. One of the things that we did was we would say, because the terrorists would say, you know, if you don't negotiate with us, we're going to kill the hostages. And we would coach people to say the hostages lives are in the hands of the terrorists, period. No spin. Not that it's good. Not that it's bad. And it would stop them from taking action. And time after time after time, we would take the initiative away from the other side. You know, their spin is always stopped with the indisputable truth. And from from ISIS, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever political persuasion, the opposition, they're trying to set up momentum that's uh, spin momentum. And as soon as you throw out something in a public discourse, it's the indisputable truth. What it does is it takes the argument out from under the other side and it gives you tremendous political advantage and nobody sees it. And so I want to unpack that a little bit. It's, it seems like what you're saying is you know, taking the old political adage of if you're explaining, you're losing and you're putting them in that position of having to explain if they want to push back, they have to basically accept it because there's no way. In, in, in the case you mentioned was saying that the hostage lives in the hands of the terrorist, then they, if they're trying to blame you for, oh, we killed them, that's their fault. They, they can't because it's obvious. It's the indisputable truth that the hostages lives are in their hands and they can't get caught up in the explaining, so they got to accept it. Is that, is that kind yeah. of what you're saying? Yeah, that's very true. It puts them in a position where they can't explain, and then suddenly it changes the game for everybody in the undecided area, which is really the target of everybody in a political sphere, whether you're a terrorist, whether you're a freedom fighter, whether you're a political leader. You're after the undecided to try to build up, because that's where the, the, best, the biggest numbers are. The middle of the bell curve is where the numbers are, for the, for the strongest sustainable base, other than, you know, Barnum said you can fool some of the people all the time, sustainable base is in the middle. That's for long-term success. Right. So how do you, so in, in political negotiations, oftentimes it seems like, uh, and this, this may not be true in kind of your conception of negotiation, but it seems to, to most people, like you kind of have the inside and the outside game. You have in the room and you have in the public. And I know in, in terrorist negotiations, you oftentimes have that as well. It's, it's not purely in public on TV or on YouTube. It's not purely on the phone with you talking with the, the terrorist leader. So you've got to figure out how to work both of those fields. How do you do that? Well, essentially with the same approach. I mean, it's a tactical application of empathy. And all empathy is is just a real good insight and understanding of emotional intelligence for human beings which means if, if, if it's for human beings, the person on the other side is going to be there because there's, there's an architecture in everybody's brain that's there and it works on basic rules. It's called the limbic system and everybody's got it. And like the respiratory system, like the circulatory system, it works on certain rules. Um, I, was, I was in Hong Kong recently and um, with the Hong Kong Police Department, they brought a bunch of psychologists in. And the psychologists, and I love it when psychologists tell me I'm wrong, <laughs> because you know I'm I'm a blue collar guy. I mean I barely, I barely got my undergraduate degree, and I got my master's basically on the sheer strength of the depth of my experience. I'm not a brilliant guy, so I love arguing with PhD. <laughs> and I got these PhDs in a room, and one of them raises their hand and they say to me, you know, we've seen, we've talked to other hostage negotiators that tell us you can't negotiate with terrorists, and you're telling us you can. So why are they wrong? What makes you right? And I said, all right, tell me a terrorist that doesn't have a limbic system. And the room goes dead silent. Because the limbic <laughs> system is the definition of the emotional circuitry that's in everybody's brain that works on the same basic rules. And that's why this stuff has universal appeal. So, you know, you just start going after the limbic system and you've got the upper hand. Now, the second side is... You know, money is the mother's milk of politics. You may not have to have all of it. You know, I've helped a lot of campaigns who have been outgunned to the financial side, but you got to have at least some, all right? You got to got to keep the trains running on time and have push cars and website and that kind of thing. And this is perennially one of the hardest things to get candidates to do is, is ask for money, dial for dollars, you know, getting in the room with folks and asking for money. And part of it is just natural, you know, they don't like feeling like they're begging for money, but a lot of it is they're, I think, is afraid of being told no. They don't want to be told no. They're afraid they can't do it. And I think that a lot of these principles uh, could, can and should be applied directly to 
asking you know, cultivating those those donors and gathering support for a campaign you know when you look at you know say chris voss is run for congress and you're trying to raise money you know how do you approach that from from a donor meeting perspective well you know with respect and deference um and then, then it begins to fall into place like you know do you want our agenda to die for lack of funding you know how can i accomplish our goals if we're underfunded, mm -hmm. you know, do you want the other side to win? Do you want to sit on the sidelines while the opposition outfunds us, out, out, out maneuvers us because of superior resources? I mean, there's a variety of ways. What it is is, I think people feel awkward with this this yes stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. And they should, because yeah, it's your, a trap and it's ineffective. Well, one of the things I, I really liked is in your description of this, you talked about how, especially that the with the yes push, that it makes us feel like we want to just scream no, just to be able to say, just to feel like we have some control. And and right. having been stuck in, the, you know, when a telemarketer calls me these days, I, I oftentimes just kind of listen. You actually go through the call just to see what they're what they're saying and the questions. I, I enjoy. It's a it just. It's, I guess it's uh, kind of masochistic, but I, I enjoy that. And it, it, it's the same thing. Even when I'm doing it kind of for fun, I just want to scream out no because of how that makes me feel. Yeah. Yeah, because you feel like you're being trapped, maneuvered, manipulated, um, uh, led into something that's bad for you when people start on this yes nonsense. And so, uh, you know, you can you can return – respect, deference, and autonomy to the other side and still ask for the money. It's not that, yeah. that that asking for the money it's wrong. What's wrong is how you're doing it. And if you're uneasy about it on, on, on this yes nonsense, then that's actually a clue that there's a better way of doing it. Not that you shouldn't be doing it, but there's a better way to do it. Now, one of the, one of the things, we, we talked about the suicide hotline, uh, the story used in the book talking about your time there was talking about you're right versus that's right. Talk a little bit about what that, you know, how you discovered that understanding and what that means. So I think it's yeah. profound. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I think there was a real focus on the suicide hotline to essentially get a that's right out of the other side, to get a summary. I mean, the, Stephen Covey's advice, seek first to understand, then be understood, uh, is not saying to the other person, I understand your pain, I feel your pain, you know, all, <laughs> all, that, all that nonsense. Yeah. You know, what it ends up being is actually accurately summarizing the other set, where they're coming from and how they feel about it so that their only possible response is they feel so completely understood. They say, that's right. I mean, again, to, to reflect to a political dynamic and on the, in the last presidential election, whichever side of the aisle you were on, when you watch the debates, whether you're pro-Republican or you're pro-Democrat, when your candidate said something you completely agreed with, People would you would jump up and point at the screen and say, that's right. Mm -hmm. Not your not your right. But that's right. Correct. That's what people say when they're all in and they don't realize that they're all in then with the person that just said it. Now, I, I took that's right kind of for granted for the longest time without realizing how hugely powerful it was. And then when I really thought about it, how wrong your right is, because your right is our polite way of saying to people that we're trying to maintain a relationship with, please stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've had more than a few of those interactions. And, and, you know, one of the things that I found early on in my life was, you know, being a, you know, a reasonably smart, driven first child. I, I, I wanted to, you know, I love debating. And that's the, the you're right is, was the gold trophy in my mind. And it, it's, it's very easily seen how quickly and destructive that can be to, to relationships and friendships. I mean, I feel like, you know, a lot of type A people, myself included, have, have injured friendships, and not lost them because of pushing for your right. Yeah. And, and it, it's in that situation, it seems like it's all about ego. It's all about who I am. It has nothing to do with yeah. who you are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and the seduction of it is is exactly what you said a moment ago. In your mind, it was the gold trophy. And completely not understanding. Empathy is about really just knowing what's going on in the other guy's mind, what's, what's happening in their mind. 
and we we don't we don't understand in many cases when someone's gone silent on us and stop returning our phone calls stop returning our emails because they've actually been saying you're right to us for a while to try to get us to shut up mm -hmm. and they don't want to talk to us anymore so yeah you're right is we unless we know better we love it <laughs> and we have no idea how destructive it is yeah it feels great but we don't see how it's breaking everything down right and, and one of those things that i think that anybody this in the modern day can can appreciate or an example is of debating somebody on facebook and really politics as a whole uh, but yeah. you know what we see is you know we'll see whether it's on and we i think we emulate it because one it feels good to us in the moment and two it's what we see on tv all the time and when we get in debate with somebody whether it's on facebook for something they just said whatever else we we go for the that's right we try to box them into that corner and just crush them and have right. use indisputable logic and it's cathartic and it's absolutely ineffective because we're doing nothing to bring them over to our side and it's something that i have to make you know, on a regular basis a conscious move I, I think it's continually being purposeful and conscious of this of this process in order to say look is my goal here catharsis or is it to actually have an outcome is it to try to pull somebody yeah. where's the person i'm talking to or among the people that i'm that are are observing the majority of the people involved that are yeah. not actually in taking part yep yeah yeah yeah, and you know, uh, I, uh, th there's an old phrase: "Win the argument, lose the relationship." Yep, it's 100 percent true. I've definitely been guilty of that in the past, and it's uh, it's something that I, uh, you know, being being involved in politics full time, there's there's unlimited opportunities for arguments. It's uh, there's <laughs> always something you can fight about with uh, you know, you, you work hard enough, you can find even your best friend, you can find something you you just uh, you get a death match over. But you know, I, I've really, as I've been training candidates and others, that that use of empathy and trying to understand where the other person's coming from is, is so important. And, and that's something that, that you've seen politically in negotiations on contracts and, and in the terrorist, uh, anti-terrorist world. Um, I, you know, when you look at those things, uh, you know, what other areas of, or these strategies, what other areas do you see that you know, when you look at politics here on the news where you just want to pull your hair out? Well, mostly it's you know the uh, it's a combination of the the, the public uh, finger pointing and and arguing, uh, then with just you know this bad idea of compromise. I mean, compromise supposedly is bread and butter politics, but compromise is I don't know what color shoes to wear with this gray suit. Do I wear brown or do I wear black? Well, let's compromise. I'll wear one brown and one black. I mean, it's just, it's a guaranteed poor implementation. It's guaranteed poor outcome. And, and, and that's why really, um, you know, there's a difference between high value exchanges, high value trades, you just have not compromise. Let's take part of my solution, part of your solution. And that's why I think by and large, Hum, uh, people of any country are disillusioned with their politicians, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on. And they're unhappy and consistently presidential elections or upset elections are won by somebody coming in and saying, hey, I'm not from that. I'm not from Washington. How many presidents have been elected because they basically said, I'm not from Washington. I'm not part of this machine that's been compromising your life away for the last thousand years. I mean, election after election after election. Bill mm -hmm. Clinton takes the White House because he talks about not being part of Washington. Jimmy Carter takes the White House because he's talking about not being part of Washington. Donald Trump takes the White House because he's talking about not being part of Washington. Yeah. It's not a new theme. No. What's wrong with Washington? A lifestyle of compromise. I love that because it's so opposite of the, the conventional wisdom. You know, I think if you were to ask a whole lot of people, if you're to ask you know, any TV commentator or something like that, you say, what's, what's wrong with DC? And I think, you know, 90% of them would say not enough compromise. Explain why, why that dichot, why they're looking at that wrong. Cause I, I think well, you're absolutely right. It, 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 if they're, they're about nothing but compromise, you know, so what do they say? The definition of a fanatic is someone who's redoubled their efforts while losing sight of their original goal. So I, I think if DC shows that um, compromise uh, is ineffective, 
the answer is to compromise even more. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's insanity, repeating the same behavior and expecting a different result. Um, and, and that's why consistently people come in and, and take the White House by saying, I'm not, I'm not going to do business the way D.C. has been doing business. I'm, I'm going to bring in something different. I mean, and, and, and to some degree, it's, it's why my view is that the best presidents, regardless of which side of the aisle they come from, have been governors of states because they've had to learn how to work with people and actually come up with implementable, implementable solutions. I mean, governors are held to account for the implementation of their solutions or they get tossed out of office. That doesn't happen in Washington, D.C. When was the last, you know, very rarely is a senator or a House of Representatives rep tossed out of office for lack of implementation. You raise a point of implementation, and I really like this. This is your fifth uh, strategy. It's, res I'm sorry, no, it's the seventh. It's guarantee execution. Talk about how you can reach a deal, and this especially happens with deals you kind of push through with the, um, you know, with getting the, the with the you're right type mentality, and you get the deal, you get the contract entry, you get the job, whatever, and then they don't things don't go the way you want them to that you thought you'd agreed to. Unpack that a bit for us. Yeah, well, um, because we think that we think that we've done our do job when we've reached agreement, uh, and that's why in a, in a private sector there are a lot of companies that fully fifty percent of their agreements are never implemented. And why, when we think we've reached agreement, you know, as they say, the devil's in the details, you know, be it laws, be it amendments, be it, be it policies that people are trying to implement. You know, we, we take our eye off the ball when we stop thinking about how we're going to make this work. Uh, and the downstream implementation, the bigger the program, gets so diffused that the people that, that agreed to a bad deal in the first place aren't held accountable for it. Hostage negotiation, it was real simple. If we didn't have an, implement, an implementable agreement upon release, then people didn't come out. We found out right away that things are going, <laughs> things yeah. are going bad. You know, one of the one of the things that really jumped, made this jump out to me uh, more than anything else, we had we had a siege in St. Martin's Parish, St. Martin's, Louisiana, in uh, the very end of 1999, just before I went into became a full time hostage negotiator. In the implementation deal, because uh, the the prisoners on the inside were convinced. They were going to catch a beating as soon as they came out because they took the sheriff hostage in the sheriff's own jail. And so one might imagine there'd be consequences <laughs> for that. One would think. Uh, you know, they said, well, you know, as soon as we come out, you're just, you're just going to beat on us. And, and, and so the, the negotiator said, OK, here's what we'll do. First guy that comes out, we'll give him a walkie talkie. He's going to walk through the inner perimeter. He's going to walk through the outer perimeter. He's going to be treated with respect. Uh, he's going to be loaded up in a wagon. He's going to be he's going to be wheeled out past all the locals into federal custody, and nobody's going to hurt him. We're not going to let the locals beat him up. So the the bad guys inside say, okay, you know, yeah, you can make that happen. Uh, we'll go for it. So first guy comes out to give him a walkie-talkie, and he comes walking through all the perimeters to pass local custody to go into federal custody. And unfortunately, one of the SWAT guys in the inner perimeter hadn't been briefed on the details of the release. And the guy comes out, he's carrying a walkie-talkie. A SWAT guy takes that away from him and says, what are you doing with a walkie-talkie? You're not supposed <laughs> to have that. So the guy goes through and he's carted away to federal custody, not getting a beating. But the negotiators on the inside, the hostage takers are freaking out. Like, he's not calling us. What's going on? You lied to us. Right. And the negotiators are going like, what, what happened here? And they, and they go run and they send one of the negotiators to go run through the perimeter to find out what happened. There's a SWAT guy with a walkie-talkie, and he says, hey, I found this guy with this walkie-talkie. See, I took it away from him. <laughs> and the negotiator's going, like, oh, oh, what are you doing? You know, give me the walkie-talkie. And he takes it, and he runs down, he finds the guy, and he calls <laughs> back in. But, you know, the devil's in the details, the implementation of keeping your word. So, you know, that was one of the things where if you don't understand implementation all the way through, the people on the other side are going to think that you lied to them even when you didn't, and then things are going to go bad. Man, yeah, I can only imagine how that felt to be like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> yeah. That's it's scary how those small things can can throw everything off track, and, and it's it's not just on you know hostage negotiation thing. That could be you're putting forward a new expense reporting policy from the from the accounting department, and you're trying to get everybody on the same page because you just killed one of their sacred cows in order to protect the, the organization better, and now you've got to get everybody on board and without causing a revolt. It, it you use the same tactics regardless. Yeah, 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 and 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 it's it's why you know every president 
that has come to D.C. and the current President Trump, he's not the only guy that's wanted to trim the bureaucracy. I mean, that was that was President Carter's number one overriding goal. And we've got so many institutions that come up with rule after rule after rule. I wish every president would uh, uh, take on uh, the, the rule of the Trump administration saying, you know, if you want to write a new rule, you got to delete two others. Yeah. Because that's all about implementation. And that's something that the government sector takes for granted that the private sector hates or any organization that gets so big that they turn into a bureaucracy in and of themselves, you know, they start piling rules on. And, and then it, it becomes less about implementation and more about the rules. And so the focus on implementation, regardless of what business you're in, whether it be the private sector or politics, is the key to success. Yeah, the, the name of your company is the Black Swan Group, and I had heard of the idea of a black swan before, uh, typically in relation to really, really bad things happening. Uh, and as I read your book, learning more about those and looking at you know, the unknown unknowns side of Rumsfeld's Matrix, I uh, found it really intriguing, and it seems like a, a really cool uh, kind, of a, uh, kind of a treasure hunt of sorts. Talk to us about what a black swan is, uh, how those factor in negotiation, and why you named your organization that yeah but the black swans are the little different the little things that make all the difference in the world and you know it's it's our view that in every interaction there's anywhere from three to five black swans that if you just knew what they were they would change everything now sort of rumsfeld's unknown unknowns thing is 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 if you just think about this through two steps and here's where the black swans are which is why you can never know in advance where they are you have to get into it and find out you're holding cards in, in every negotiation, in every position, in every interaction. There's stuff you're hiding. I've asked people, were you ever in a negotiation when you weren't holding cards? Were you ever in an interaction when you didn't have proprietary insider information that if it got out would make you vulnerable? And I've never had anybody say to me, ah, no, that doesn't happen to us. It happens to everybody in all situations. If you've got it, the other side has it. Where are the black swans? We don't know of the overlap of the hidden cards until they're shown. There's no way we can know what exists in that overlap. And that's what Rumsfeld was talking about in the unknown unknowns. No matter how smart you are, the other side doesn't know what's important and they don't know and completely what to hide because they don't know to you what's important. And it's this sort of never, never land in the overlap of the unknowns. And that's where the great deals are are made and you have to engage with the other side re in a respectful even deferential manner to get them to drop their cards to get to see what's on the other side and then you can see where the real possibilities are once the unknowns actually once the hidden cards you start to find the overlap in the hidden cards and so how do you go about doing that well you know some of it is just engaging in a, in a non-shrill dialogue, in a non-accusatory dialogue, because they're more likely to say things that they think are completely innocuous, but since they don't know your hidden cards, end up being tremendously important. Um, and it's, for lack of a better term, and, and I'll quote a California's top trial attorney several years in a row, one of the Aaron Brockovich attorneys, one of the guys on behalf of the plaintiffs. I meet this guy, his name is Tom Girardi. And I'm expecting an attack dog because most of my adult life is in and around New York City and uh, you know the top trial attorneys are attack dogs. I'm even gonna rip you apart in court. And I hear this guy Girardi is a top trial attorney so many times that the last time the Bar Association said he was a top trial attorney in California, which puts him in a running for top trial attorney in the United States. You know, they say Tom Girardi again. So I'm like, I can't wait to hear what this attack dog's going to say when he comes to my class. He comes walking in, and he says the secret to negotiations are being nice and gentle. <laughs> I mean, if you met Tom in person and somebody told you that he did in the, in, around Christmas, he's the Santa in Macy's, you'd be like, yeah, what a sweet guy. What a sweet, non-threatening guy. Because Tom is so shrewd, he knows you're going to drop your guard. He knows if he's nice and gentle, you're going to relax and not only start laying the cards on the table that you know are important, but start talking about things that you have no idea are important until Tom hears them. 
And and that's how you get into it. And Tom Girardi came from nothing, and he's a billionaire, and he's ridiculously successful. And he's and he didn't get there by attacking people. He get there by understanding the value of being non-threatening. That's phenomenal. Well, as we're as we're wrapping up here, I just want to give you opportunity if there's any final thoughts or wisdom you want to share with with our listeners that will uh, will get them on the right path. I, I hope everybody will go out and buy your book. It's it's something that uh, you know I I've actually found it through a, a mastermind group that I'm part of, and that was one of the books that we read late last year. Uh, and I know from talking to a bunch of the other guys, and there's about sixty or so of us in this network. And just hearing the stories of everything from uh, getting upgrades to the rental car counter to, you know, getting their accounts payable, uh, you know, taken care of and cleared out, all, all kinds of stories from these guys about how it's impacted their lives. And I'm really excited to put it to work within campaigns and experimenting with ways to use this from donors to individual voter discussions. You know, what kind of uh, what kind of final words you got for us today, Chris? You know, and, and after the final word, I'm hoping you you give me a chance to give everybody uh, um, understand about how how to subscribe to my newsletter as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, yeah. All right, but if you can draw the distinction between understanding and agreement, Covey's advice: seek first to understand, then be understood. If you have got the courage to be able to say, "I understand," without agreeing, then an entire new world has opened up, and you now have the opportunity. To forge agreements where you couldn't be couldn't forge them before, and it's it's a fine line, but it makes the difference between only being able to negotiate in a very narrow sense to being able to successfully negotiate with anyone on the planet. Understanding is not agreement, and that that's that's the definition of empathy, which then you can articulate the other side's position without agreeing to it. It's powerful. It's insane. That's awesome. So tell folks how they can subscribe to your email list and where they can find you online, where they can buy your books, because I'm hoping a lot of these folks will take advantage of it. All right, the best price on a book is, uh, is always going to be on Amazon. I mean, when we buy copies of the book, I don't buy them from my publisher, I buy them from Amazon. <laughs> but, the, and, but the gateway to everything that we teach, uh, the most power, you know, the gate, uh, and is, is our newsletter, which comes out once a week, and it's short, digestible, concise, you know, um, there's just one article in it. I mean, you don't wear yourself out trying to figure out what to read. And it's also the gateway to all our training, the training announcements in it, the gateway to the other products, the gateway to the website, which is blackswanltd.com. But the best way to subscribe to the newsletter is to text to the number 22828, and that's 22828. And the text needs to be all one word, FBI empathy. Don't let your autocorrect. Put a space between FBI and empathy, lowercase FBI empathy, all one word, to 22828. You get a dialogue box back that signs you up for the newsletter, and that's the gateway to everything we do. We've got we get a lot of stuff that's free, and we've got stuff uh, training that we charge for, and we've got a lot of specialized lessons, and we've actually got some more stuff coming out probably by the end of the month. So the the, the newsletter, The Edge... Uh, has great tips in it. It's concise, digestible, actionable, and it's the gateway to everything that we have. That's awesome. Well, I'm a subscriber, and I've been enjoying it for the last couple months. I hope everybody, as you're listening, this stuff is is incredible. It it will help you in everything, like Chris says, the book from negotiating bedtimes to saving lives and negotiating contracts. As, as campaign folks, <laughs> it's going to help you get votes. It's going to help you get donor dollars in the bank and help you hopefully negotiate better deals when when you're actually in office and helping to to right the ship of the whatever office you're holding. Chris, thank you so much for being generous with your time and joining us today. I'm excited to, to listen back through this sucker and, and make sure I'm taking some some more notes about what you shared. And uh, I'm excited to to hear back from our listeners about what they thought was was most important or how this this changed their their thought process. So thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure, Roz. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Chris Voss of Black Swan Group. I had a blast getting to talk to him after reading his book and tracking so much of his involvement through his blog and podcast he's been on. I kind of got to fangirl it up quite a bit during the interview, if you noticed, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And I'm really hoping you guys will take a lot of the information you shared and put it right to work in your campaigns, in your donor meetings. I know that I'm going to be doing that when I'm talking to major donors and helping campaigns put together scripts and their fundraising pitches. I've been brainstorming ideas even as I've been listening back through and getting the podcast ready to go live here, and I'm, I'm stoked to, to get this put in place and up in my repertoire here pretty soon. 
Thank you guys so much for listening. If you're not a subscriber, hit the subscribe button so you'll get these episodes new every single week, whether they're interviews or me talking about and going deep into detail about a specific area of campaigns and how you can do it better. And if you're interested in helping us more, there are two real ways that I would love to have your support. Number one is by giving us a rating on iTunes. This really helps us as we're being discovered by other people. It's one of the big ways that Apple and other podcast catchers that will help other people find us. So that's number one. Number two is through Patreon. It takes a lot of money to get this podcast out there every week, and I enjoy doing it, but as we're getting more and more people that are reaching out and telling us how much of this is impacting their lives and their campaigns, we wanted to open up an opportunity for if you want to help us help sponsor this podcast, that you'll have a way to do that. And we would really appreciate the help. It'll make sure that we can keep producing quality content every single week, and I want to keep doing that. The way to do that is in the show notes. You'll be able to find our Patreon link, or you can also go to Patreon. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash my campaign coach. That's Patreon dot com slash my campaign coach. And Ted Cruz style, I will say it a third time Patreon dot com slash my campaign coach. It's in the show notes, it's on the blog, whether it's $1 or $100 a month. This is one of those things that would be a huge help to us as we're trying to make sure that we can keep doing this for perpetuity. So if you're enjoying the podcast, if you're getting something good out of it, please go to patreon.com slash mycampaigncoach and give us a little bit of love. In the meantime, we'll talk to you guys again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.